Welcome to Code Porn, the show that has nothing to do with porn and everything to do with talking to awesome developers. Today we're here with Amir Rajan, who is going to talk to us about and show us ASP.NET Oak. Amir is a true polyglot with an unwavering passion for software. He's always striving to better the industry through open source contributions, training, and blogging. Welcome, Amir. Hey, how's it going, Dustin? Okay, so Oak is described as providing frictionless development for ASP.NET MVC single-page web apps. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what makes it frictionless compared to other frameworks, such as Angular, Ember, uh, or even uh, the, the now popular Durandal? Well, so the great thing about Oak is that um, Oak actually concentrates more on the server side. So there's already phenomenal front-end frameworks out there. You have Angular, as you know, Angular, Ember, um, Durandal uses Breeze.js at one point. So there's a lot of good front end uh, JavaScript frameworks out there. The challenge was that uh, the challenge I was dealing with was using these front end frameworks. How can I get the back end to actually be more amicable to heavy JavaScript applications? So what Oak is is actually um, Polyfill on top of ASP and MVC to make it easier to consume these these uh, JSON payloads that are coming from these front end frameworks. So it's actually a server side tech as opposed to a client side technology. So just to show you kind of um, uh, just to show you the website and, and a little bit of the information on there, so you can Google Oak MVC. It'll be the first hit that you get. And um, what it, what essentially it does is that it doesn't try to compete with any of the uh, front end frameworks that are out there. So the premise there is that you use jQuery, you use Knockout, Angular, Ember, whichever framework you would like, and then have your back end uh, supported support those frameworks via Oak. So what Oak does is that it uses the DLR, which is the Dynamic Language Runtime, and what it does is it takes those JSON tables that are coming from the front end and create dynamic objects that can be used in the back end without a lot of trouble as far as you know creating DTOs or view models or a lot of the boilerplate code that we're used to doing. So here's the Oak website. Um, towards towards the bottom, you'll see you'll see a, a link in there to jump to the sample apps, and these sample apps show how you can use you can use Oak. With a number, with an array of front-end JavaScript frameworks, so plain old jQuery, Backbone, Backbone, Net, Marinette, Angular, Ember.js, and then Ember uh, and Knockout also. So that's kind of open in a nutshell. So it kind of solves the problem of having to write all of the the layering and the mapping code when building SPAs on the back end. Just all you're doing is really mapping it to the database, and this kind of solves that. Yes, that's correct. So I just uh, you get a dynamic payload from the front end, and I run with that. Uh, C Sharp's got some incredible dynamic capabilities, so I take advantage of that. Use that dynamic type, and uh, through and through from the database all the way up to the view. Wow, that's very handy. Writing all that boilerplate code is just that's the worst. Eats up so much time, and yeah, we'll see that in action too. Okay. All right. Uh, so it looks like Oak has gotten some pretty good publicity being featured on ASP.NET MVC's website, uh, Herding Code Podcast, .NET Rocks, and uh, MSDN, and a bunch of other reputable publications. Uh, how has that affected the user base of Oak? Uh, are there any notable companies or projects that use Oak currently? Well, surprisingly, Oak has gotten a whole lot of traction overseas. So there's actually a company uh, in the Czech Republic that's actively using Oak across their code base. Um, uh, th there are four developers that are actually contributing to the Oak code base, so I'm, I'm moving it over to Mono support now. So currently, Oak is, uh, uses um, MS SQL and is on Windows. Uh, we have there's four developers overseas that is, uh, and they're actually converting it to support Mono and Postgre. So th as far as corporate back, you know, there's there's companies that are using this. Um, so th and the great thing is that a lot of the things. Uh, where I previously worked, we had a very large um, application. It was about 30 to 40,000 lines of JavaScript, primarily Knockout. And a lot of the things that uh, Oak is inspired from is, is, is from that code base. So there were a lot of pain points that we felt trying to map a very large front-end application to statically type based in NBC. So from that, I learned a lot, of, a lot of nice things and then extracted Oak from, from that code base. So technically, Oak was... Oak is a byproduct of a pain that I was feeling. So it, it's not really a thought experiment. It's been executed and exercised in that production environment already. And I just extracted it and uh, put it out there for others to use. Awesome. That's usually how those projects start. And so Oak is open yep. source, so anyone can contribute to it? Yes, and it's under MIT license. Um, the, wiki is, the wiki has very good documentation. Um, it shows how to 
uh, contribute to Oak. Um, and if you ever, uh, if you're, if anyone out there that's interested in contributing to Oak, feel free to reach out to me uh, on my blog or via Twitter or email, and um, I'd be happy to sit with you on Skype and kind of get you up and running. Awesome. Is there anything that you really need done uh, on the project at the moment? Uh, if you want to do single page applications, you know, just kind of, uh, I could always use some more sample apps on how how Oak integrates with, you know, different different single page apps. The current samples are, you know, for simple simple Ember JS application or Angular JS. So if someone wants to contribute a more complex application, that'd be great. Um, also, uh, also any contribute on contributions on Mono or Postgres support would be wonderful. Also. Awesome. Well, there you have it. So if you want to do that, go check it out. And we'll put the links up uh, in the description and uh, at the end of the show. All cool. right. Sounds good. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's get back to uh, getting started with Oak. One of the things that I noticed on the website uh, as a prerequisite that might scare off Microsoft developers is the use of mm -hmm. Ruby as a prerequisite. Uh, what yep. is it used for? And, and do developers have to know Ruby in order to use it? So Ruby is specifically used for build automation. And, um, the, the great thing about how Oak is set up is that you don't have to know Ruby to use it. You just need to know Rake, which is a Ruby make, and there's a set of Rake commands that will build your application, um, deploy to IS Express, export your SQL scripts. So it's, it's one or two, uh, two word commands that you use that happen to be backed by, backed by Ruby. So the great thing about this is that you can start being productive with using uh, build automation outside of Visual Studio and in your uh, CI environments without having to know too much uh, Ruby or Rake. And then this is a stepping stone for you to, you know, kind of get into Rake and see, see what's available there. It's a very powerful tool. And uh, uh, there's, there's many, there's a lot of .NET projects out there that use Rake for build automation. So it's a, it's a, it's a good way to do it. All right. Now, why Rake instead of uh, MS Build? Uh, MS Build, uh, so it, the Rake scripts actually use parts of MS Build to build the application out. Um, some of the rate commands that are out there just don't have MS build counterparts. So an example would be um, some developer support commands that I've built into, into Oak. So there's a way where you can actually simulate a round robin load balance locally through a rate, through a rate command. You know, I, I may be mistaken, but I don't think there's any MS build commands that you know, could simulate that kind of environment. And that's been helpful for me for like testing out session state to make sure that I'm handling session correctly across you know, multiple servers. And the nice thing with these rake commands is that they could be anything from build automation to just commands that help the developer out. Okay, well, uh, let's let's stop talking about it and let's have you show us some Oak. All right. So um, the prerequisites are on on the website um, Oak MVC. So my prerequisites are installed. You need Ruby, and uh, there's a Ruby gem called Warmup that we'll use to download a solution template and bootstrap our application with Oak. So with one line of code, I'm going to create a solution with an MVC project and a test project. And here it is right here. So form up. And uh, we'll just create a simple uh, uh, person app. So we'll, we'll create a CRUD app that stores an ID and name and then returns an ID and name. Okay. So running this command, what this is going to do is download a solution template and then uh, bootstrap with open, OAP with a uh, MVC project, a UI automation test suite, and, a, and a, um, a unit test suite. So this is downloading that and putting that together. So what we would have to do as developers if we did this through Visual Studio would be to create a blank solution, add the MVC project, add the test project, reference the MVC project, add our UI automation suite, add Selenium, add all the NuGet packages, and it's just a lot of work up front. So this template is just baked and ready to go with that. So now I can uh, CD into that directory and then start with the solution. All right, and there we have it. So running that uh, warm-up template uh, got us a solution that is bootstrapped to Doke. Okay. All right. So this is a uh, this is a, a blank controller. There's nothing there's nothing really in here. Okay. Aside from aside from uh, the the oak uh, bits that are included in here, this is your plain Jane um, NBC ASP.NET and NBC uh, solution template. All right. So let's see this in action. 
So inside of here, I'm going to run a command called uh, Sidekick. Now what Sidekick does, and again this is part of Oak, uh, it basically keeps track of what changes are made to the file system and builds and deploys my application for me. All right, so we have that running. And I'm going to, and as mentioned before, we are going to use Rake for uh, for deployment and build automation. So I'm going to call Rake, default, and then server. So what this is going to do is it's going to build the application and start up IS Express for us. Now the nice thing with uh, taking this approach is that I don't have to actually start up the debugger at any point in time. So notice that I have IS Express started right here, and from here I can actually see information about um, what is happening with the request pipeline. So if I go to uh, HTTP colon localhost. So we d we don't have an index HTML page. This is why we're getting this uh, error page that shows up. But notice that we also get that information inside of the IS Express console. So using using an external uh, component like this, the way Oak does, makes it really easy to see what's actually happening with your web application, especially over uh, asynchronous payloads, where you won't get the exception directly inside of the browser. Wow, so this is a this is a form of instant feedback. You don't have to fire up F5 to to get this information. It's just there for you as you're coding. It's a, exactly. So we can actually, and we'll actually see this update uh, on the fly also. So notice that uh, we're currently getting the error that says there's no index page. So we'll go ahead and add the index page to our to our project. Okay. Notice that the website is deployed, right? Now, what is this notification that we're seeing there? What is that? Uh, that notification is Growl for Windows. So basically what's happening is Sidekick is keeping track of the file changes and it's using Growl for Windows to display that notification. Now, you don't have to have Growl for Windows running if you don't want that. You'll get the notifications here anyways on this screen. So if you have dual monitors, it's really good to have this you know, running on a separate monitor and then get that information. So notice that I didn't say uh, I didn't. I'm not sure I'm going to start with the debugger. All I've done is save the application. Now when I refresh the page, you'll notice that we're up and running. So Oak is bootstrapped with Twitter Bootstrap 3. Uh, so it's got some nice styling built in. You don't have to worry about trying to bring in styles. It also it also comes with jQuery and underscore JS. So I don't uh, bootstrap it with a uh, a JavaScript framework per se. That's that's up to you to choose the one that you like. But at least it's got you know some of the some of the basics in there. So Oak okay. will Oak will work with Angular, Ember, and any other flavor of uh, SPA JavaScript libraries that a developer wanted yep. to choose. It's, or perfect. Yep, the developer can choose whichever one they want. Uh, it, it, from the from the uh, template, it only has jQuery and underscore in there. And underscore, underscore JS is is a, a suite of like functions, JavaScript functions that. We we all wish that JavaScript had out of the box, so it's it's a really good set of libraries right there. Okay. Perfect. So, so let me show you let me show you this feedback loop. Now notice that uh, I don't have the debugger uh, debugger running, so I can just do debug dot message equals uh, hello, right, and save that, and then debug dot message, and there we go. So very very fast feedback without having to go through that uh, uh, that debug start start the debugger watch it change and you know all that other good stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's incredible because I'm I'm the kind of developer who after writing that single line of code will hit F5 and wait 10 minutes for it to fire up and build and compile <laughs> whatever just to see yeah. hello show up on the screen. So that's that's yep. a huge time saver for me. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we'll go ahead. And we're going to create this uh, single page application. So I'm going to come in here and uh, create a uh, input uh, type equals uh, text, uh, ID equals name. We're, we're going to create a person table, so we'll have uh, name and uh, name and ID there. That that'd be a good starting point for that. And uh, name equals name because that's what's actually being used by um, HP and NBC. Type equals submit. Value equals insert. Cool. And then uh, form. Oh, we won't need a form element. We'll we'll send this asynchronously over. Sounds good. All right. Okay. And then uh, what we'll do here is we'll give this an ID also. And then in our script block, uh, script block. 
do a jQuery script, and we'll say on when we click the Save button, we'll do a post, and then we'll post to we'll just post to home slash um, create. And uh, for now, let's just send over. Uh, okay, we can we can send over the name. Pretty good, right there. Okay, pretty basic. All right, pretty basic. We refresh our page. There we go. Now uh, I'll, I'll send over just a mirror, and I'll click the insert button, and it says done. Now we can see exactly what's happening on the back end. So right here, so we see the reco uh, request right here, home slash create, and the request ended, right? So we're actually seeing the feedback immediately that the post is actually going through. Now on the back end, we don't actually have a controller handling that, okay? So let's go ahead and create our action result. And this will be an HTTP post. And we'll return a new empty result. Empty result is uh, HTTP 200. And what we're going to do here is we're going to create a, um, a variable called dynamic app params. Now, this is part of OAP. What this is saying is that whatever uh, form payload that we're getting from the front end, we're just going to create a dynamic object out of that. So we're good. So you don't have to create a DTO or some kind of C sharp data structure to put in your your create method parameters. That's correct. Okay. So so now when I refresh this page, I'll go ahead and um, insert a mirror again. Okay. We get the done. Now look at our JSON payload. So you can see that this dynamic object is is uh, first of all we can see the payload and we can see exactly what's coming over. Wow! Huge okay. time saver. Yes, yes. So so now it comes to data access. How do we handle uh, the persistence of this data? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, um, uh, again, this is dynamic through and through. So I'm going to create a, a dynamic repository. And uh, I'll call it, um, I'll call it uh, uh, people. Dynamic repository. So there's our class. I'm going to create an instance of that uh, dynamic repository. Okay. And I will do people.insert at params. So what is, okay. uh, what is dynamic repository? Uh, dynamic repository is a hard fork of masses. Um, are you familiar with uh, uh, massive the dynamic ORM? I'm not, but it does have the uh, kind of an active record feel from from Ruby. Yes, yes, it is. It is definitely more of an active record setup. And a little bit of background on that: uh, what I found with, especially with the single page applications and where the web is kind of heading, um, I find that data persistence is very uh, the life cycle for the data persistence is short lived, very short lived, and um, and the scope is very small. So uh, back in the day when we were doing uh, when we were doing large post back cycles, you had to have a a, a, a stateful ORM, I would say, with which would save the entire hierarchy of you know records and everything. And what I found with building single page applications, um, that the need for that stateful heavy ORM has kind of gone away from me, and I can take a little bit more of a, a lean and faster approach with uh, doing data access. So it does have more of an active record field because of that. Yeah, so if you're if you're trying to follow along here, what he's done is basically done no coding at all. He's wiring up the back end without writing what just a, a few uh, lines of code here. So you don't have to create your models, your DTOs to go over the wire uh, to be mapped to your JSON objects, and you don't have to spend time writing uh, the boilerplate code for your repositories. Yes. So let's see what happens now. So we don't actually have a database set up right now. 
um, we haven't done that part of the code base. So let's see what kind of error that uh, error we actually get when we do this. So I'll go ahead and say that's going to redeploy, and then um, I'm going to you know refresh the page. Sorry, with a little click on the draw there. There we go. And then a mirror, and then insert. Okay, we get the done. And so we get an exception, basically saying that um, if we cannot open database peeps. Login failed for uh, my computer. Right. So this is where rate comes in. Again, uh, th the idea is to make it just ridiculously easy to get up and running. So there's actually a command called rake uh, create db that will create my database. So there we go. I have a database created. So now if I do the insert again, we're going to get another exception this time. So this is uh, this is uh, what was what was attempted right here. Insert into um, people and then name and then the value. And um, what we the exception that we're getting here is this invalid object name people. So it's trying to insert into a table that doesn't exist. Notice that we're getting the payload that's coming over, the exception that occurred, and the SQL that was attempted. And if you want access to this information, you can always go to the stack trace here to get get that information there. Yeah, there's no like, oh, this exception happened now. I have to now I have to catch it again. You get all that information readily available to you. Yeah, it's like fiddler on crack. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So invalid object name people. Now, how do we handle that? Well, Oak comes with a lightweight scaffolding mechanism called Seed. Now, inside of Seed, I can actually it's just a simple class here, and in here I can actually generate tables um, to to uh, I guess. Uh, ge generate schema and generate sample entries. So let's create a, a people table and then see this insert go all the way through. All right? So all, all you have to do to generate a table is uh, just create a method in here and uh, with a string parameter and call it create people. And seed has just a really lightweight DSL. So you just do seed.create table and uh, people is the name of the table and then the parameters are um, are an array of dynamic types. Now, the reason I did that was just to make it a little bit easier to just to define tables on the fly. So ID, uh, so I can create or columns on the fly. So I can create seed ID, which will give me an identity column, and then um, I'm going to create a name column, and it's going to be n bar char uh, 255. So the nice the, the nice thing about taking this approach is that I'm not trying to map it to a, um, a CLR type. I'm speaking database here. I know the exact column name, you know, NVARTAR 255. There's no, there's no um, you know, trying to map a POCO to a dynamic object. It's just painful from that standpoint to try to get the SQL type correct. So I just create a lightweight DSL that says, just tell me what you want the column name to be, and uh, we'll, we'll put it there. So now that we have, that, we have the column name, we just uh, yield return the scripts. Uh, yield return create people, a pointer to that script, like so. And then we run a command called rake reset, which will regen our database for us. And now we actually have a people, ta uh, a people table correct, uh, created. So if I go in and refresh this page and type a mirror and insert, you'll notice that we have no exception. That uh, if you weren't talking and explaining it to me, it would have taken you maybe what two minutes to get that working. Yeah. Versus the yeah. traditional method of uh, then you set up either your EF code first migrations or the SQL, whichever way you want to go, plus your mapping and the the uh, controller actions, and wow, that's that's a huge time right. saver. Um, you'll notice also that there's a uh, it tells you that you can run a command called rake export, so I can actually run ex rake export here. And uh, what it's going to do is inside of the actual uh, directory where this is located, so if I go to C, um, IS, uh, IS Express, this is just where the application is uh, deployed, you'll notice that uh, it actually generates a SQL for me. So this, this can be run against um, any database or any MS SQL database, and it just takes a very simple approach to say this is how you do schema migration. Now, if you want something a little bit more heavyweight, uh, there's things that already exist out there, so I don't want to reinvent the wheel there. I would use Fluent Migrator. It's phenomenal for uh, more complex migrations. Also, you can use, um, uh, uh, what's it called? 
from the Chuck Norris framework, it is called a roundhouse, and that's a that's a migration suite also, and that can hook directly into the seed controller to give you uh, give you a more heavyweight migration uh, strategy. But at least for initial you know initial database creation, initial website creation, I found this to be very easy to get up and running. Okay, well that answers uh, one of the questions I had about actually moving this into production, but. So in this uh, in this schema here, you would have to come mm -hmm. in and update this if you changed your JSON payload coming over the wire. Right. Now, what if what if you didn't do that and the payload had additional fields or properties on it? Will that be handled okay. by? Let, let's take a look at what would happen here. So if I go in and um, do let's say um, age or DOB. Like so. Okay. I'll go ahead and uh, save that. I'll refresh the page. I'll try the insert. And uh, we'll get an exception. So the exception here is saying um, invalid column name DOB. And, it's a, and, and the error message tries to be very helpful for you. So it looks like you're trying to save a property that doesn't exist in your database. To exclude unwanted properties, override the iDictionary string object get attributes to save method on your repository. So you can basically override that method and exclude any properties that you don't want inserting into your database. Perfect. So it makes it very easy to um, just just the messages are very helpful um, and you'll you'll it gives you a good amount of information as far as how to deal with these kind of exceptions. Okay. All right. So we have um, we have the persistence done. Uh, let's let's insert some sample entries just to have uh, a little bit of variety in there. Okay, so I can go ahead and insert some sample sample entries in here. Like so. Okay. All right. And then um, running running leg sample will insert that sample entry for me. And let's see what those sample entries now look like. Um, so let's create a action result here, and uh, we'll call it list to actually list people. And then we're just going to we're we're just going to uh, return JSON, and we'll just do uh, people. Dot all. Like so. Okay. All right. So now if I just go to home slash list. It's empty right now, and I will run controller setup, insert into Pete. Oh, sorry, wrong table name, people. For example, and there we are. We have some sample data in there. Right. Okay? So now if I go in and enter that, and go to there we go. So now I want to point out that you have not once in this whole demonstration pressed F5 to start up Visual Studio, and you've spent about maybe five minutes actually writing code to get this application <laughs> up and running. Gives off a quite a Ruby vibe there, or a Rails vibe. Right. So here's here's the here's the interesting thing. Um, so there's there's testing uh, available in there. I have I have a suite of um, screencast on the Oak website that will go, there are 10 minutes a piece and they'll go into the testing piece of it and how that part works. Um, what I do want to show off is uh, the UI automation. So we have, uh, we, have this, we have this entry here. Okay. I'm going to clean it up just a little bit. Let's get the, uh, let's get the rest of it working. So instead of, uh, instead of the alert, um, we'll actually uh, create a div. And in that, we'll call this ID uh, people. And we'll rehydrate this div on, on retrieval. So then here we would do dollar sign dot get JSON um, home slash list. And then the function will have the our data that we need. And uh, we should be able to just, if my jQuery skills are up to par, we should be able to just say dot HTML. Um, is there a string define method? JSON. Well, we'll just see. We'll, we'll for each over underscore dot uh, dot each data 
function. And we will take the people and append a div with the name of the person. That should do it right there. All right. People, and uh, before we do the git JSON and do that, we want to clear out the div. Like so. There we go. We got two mirrors in there. Uh, let me go ahead and clean this up a little bit. I'll just create a get uh, people method here and just extract that. And again, all this is deploying automatically deploying for me. I'm not having to, you know, start the debugger up or anything. It's just the feedback loop is keeping track of all these changes. So there we go. I'll add a horizontal rule just to make it a little bit nicer. There we go. And I'll run break sample to reset my database. And we're back to square one. There we go. How does that look? Man, that's great. All right. So let's let's run the UI automation. So the UI automation, uh, brace yourself, is actually an F sharp. So you have three languages that you get to play around with. You get C sharp, Ruby, and F sharp. <laughs> Now, the beauty of the reason that we chose F Sharp, uh, the, this, this part of the framework is called Canopy. Canopy is a UI automation framework actually built by another developer. And he's done a phenomenal job of making it incredibly easy to do UI automation. So if, you've, if you haven't done UI automation before, I would strongly uh, recommend doing this. You don't have to know F Sharp to run these tests, and I, as I'll show you right here. And um, the, amount of, the amount of work that you have to do to try to get Selenium to work as smoothly as this thing, is, it, it was, it's two years in the making of this framework. So a lot of good work done in here. Uh, the developer who built this, uh, his name is Chris Holt, um, and he's actually a full-time F-Sharp developer. So he actually does this for a living. He does, he does QA automation and web development for, uh, for a company over here in Dallas. So we'll go ahead and uh, look at what this uh, UI automation looks like. So notice that we have a test class here. Uh, you give it a nice little description, and then you say URL, HTTP local at 3000. So what this will do is navigate to uh, this URL. What we'll do next is inside of the name, we are going to insert, uh, we're going to set that property to a value, like that. Then we're going to click the insert button. Okay, and then we're going to verify that the, uh, what did we call this? We call this people, okay, and name is lowercase. Let me make that change. The name, and we're going to verify that people, uh, there's, there's actually a, a regex operator for those that, um, uh, that, that know, know about regex, you can do that right there. We're going to verify that the people div has a mirror in there. And okay. so this framework here is based on Selenium? It is built on top of Selenium. It's a stabilization layer on top of Selenium. And just to show you the website, um, Canopy, you can just type in Canopy F Sharp, and it's going to be the first link there. Again, full documentation. This is a heavyweight framework that it's used and it's very real, um, but we're using uh, we're using the regex match operator, which is equal tilde. Sorry, and what this is going to do is, but yes, it's built on top of Selenium. Um, it also can use Phantom JS if that's your um, per preferred UI automation framework. Um, but it's a DSL that and DSL and stabilization layer on top of Selenium. So here, what we're saying is, uh, we'll say inserting a person. Insert a person, go to this URL, 
put this value in, inside of this CSS selected click the insert person uh, insert person button and then verify that the div contains uh, the person that was inserted. Yeah, compared to Selenium, this is just ridiculously simple. Yeah, yep, and and there's a lot of work put in here to make sure that um, it tries multiple times to make sure that the element is there. It 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 does a very good job of making making your UI automation very stable. Yeah, so Canopy is is a project that would be worth looking at independently of Oak. Definitely, for anybody yeah. who's looking to do UI automation and has looked at Selenium or some of the other alternatives. That's correct. And in fact, if you just want the feedback loop, uh, just to save in the update, and you don't want to use the, um, the dynamic capabilities of Canopy, there's a separate uh, uh, NuGet package out there called Spec Watcher that's specifically for that feedback loop. So all these components are broken up to where you can use them independently if you want. All right, so we can actually see this in action now. So it's, a UI, it's another rake script. You just run rake UI, and this will start up. Um, I have this bootstrap with Firefox, but you uh, you can use Chrome or IE also. And then it just starts it up, and there you go. Test pass. Now that one kind of quick. Um, so there's actually something called WIP, and uh, WIP stands for work in progress. And what this will do is actually so, slow down the test for you, so you can actually see what how the how the UI is being interacted with. And it will actually highlight the areas that are being uh, used. So notice that the green area, right there. So there you go. The amount of uh, thoughtfulness that went behind this is just incredible. Yes, and and it, it all comes from having to deal with uh, single page applications. We found that doing uh, you know unit testing JavaScript wasn't the best thing to do. It was just brittle. It was painful. Working with the DOM was painful. Working with Selenium was really painful, so we just wanted to streamline all of this stuff, and um, uh, and just just make it make web development fun again. You know, just just make you happy to you know work with work with these kind of applications. Get as much feedback as you can uh, through the back end, uh, through IS Express, through the dynamic payloads that are coming around uh, off the wire. Uh, cut down on the boilerplate, simplify schema generation, all those things to help you build these applications. Yeah, it really takes away the pain points that, you know, it's it's insanity. Developers they do the same thing over and over again. Most of their time is spent on that boilerplate <laughs> code, and wow. Yep. So um, eventually, eventually your code will get to a point where you know it's not just create, retrieve, update, and delete. And um, uh, Oak has that, uh, of course, covered. Um, if you go to the wiki, uh, you can look at. You can look at how to expand off of just using uh, re retrieval, uh, just doing simple CRUD-based applications to things that require associations. So if you have parent-child relationships, you can set up dynamic uh, dynamic associations. It also comes with validation, um, acceptance, confirmation, numericality, presence, uniqueness. You can create your own validations. Um, all this is part of uh, part of Oak, and you start from the simple, you know, classless approach. And then, as you start needing uh, more more things, uh, Oak has you covered from that standpoint. And the screencast on the Oak website will take you into detail on how to use each one of these components, along with, of course, the documentation here. Uh, so, what what state is Oak in right now? Is it production ready? Oh yeah, yeah, it's definitely production ready. Um, uh, the the pieces of Oak that were ex extracted, especially the dynamic capabilities of Oak. Um, are used in an environment where they literally got uh, during peak time we got a million requests a day. So this is a this is heavy heavyweight stuff. Uh, on top of that, uh, the Oak code base is actually smaller than the Knockout JS. So the amount of code that's actually written to do this is is it's just a lot of polyfill on top of ASP down at MVC. So Oak doesn't try to reinvent you know like uh, HTTP modules or the request lifecycle or anything. It's just a dynamic model binder on top of MVC. And then the dynamic runtime to make you to make it very easy to build these kind of applications. So very small code base. All right. So basically, to get up and running, uh, just go to the website. You need to learn a few rate mm -hmm. commands, which you can run from Visual Studio. Uh, so yep. maybe an hour's time investment, but the amount of time that you save in developing your applications by not having to write boilerplate is just uncalculable. Yes. Yeah, and um, the the screencast. There's four screencasts. They'll take you through, the, you know, creating an Oak website. Um, it also comes with an interactive tutorial. So if you bring in an Oak website from the beginning, 
happening and you don't have anything in there, you can actually work through a blog sample app. And it's built in. You, you can write the code, hit save, it'll refresh the page, and you get that interactive tutorial uh, up and running. So is there anything that you haven't thought of or addressed at this point? Because it seems like you've covered everything. Yeah, yeah. I think it's in a, it's in a very good place. Uh, this, is, this is going on to three years now. And um, it's actually in its final version. Uh, we're working on uh, mono support now. So the, the code base is stable. There's really not uh, much work that's left. Uh, the, the nice thing is that using the dynamic runtime, the way we're using it here, is that you can actually create your own Oak plugins. So you know you have jQuery plugins that do additional things. Uh, there's some base plugins for validation association, uh, change tracking, um, memoization is another plugin. Those are those ship with Oak, but it'll also give you a template of how to create your own plugin, so you can extend it however you'd like. Awesome. Yep. But it, it just it'll just make you happy. That's that's been that's been my goal. That's been the goal of all the developers on Oak is just to make it fun again to work with these kind of applications. And then please try the sample apps out. They show an array of uh, using some front end JavaScript frameworks, everything from Backbone to Angular. Oh, there you have it. Yeah, there you have it. That uh, I was actually unprepared for the awesomeness of, of Oh, left me speechless most of the time. But uh, I, I thank you for coming on and showing Oak and you know, its awesome power. So you can find more about Oak at amirrajan.net slash Oak. And you can find Amir on Twitter at Amir Rajan on his blog at amirrajan.net, and on GitHub at github.com slash amirrajan. And you can also find Oak on GitHub, github.com slash amirrajan slash oak. Yep, and, uh, and the great thing is that you can just type in Oak MVC. It is the first hit on Google. So, <laughs> so yes, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and if you want to contribute to uh, some of the other, the other things, open source parties that I'm working on, uh, reach out to me and I'd be happy to help you get started with open source. No problem. Awesome. More Microsoft developers need to participate in open source projects. Yep, and I'm, I'm a friendly one, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's a big problem with uh, the Microsoft developers is the, the fear of uh, embarrassment or the, the attitudes of the open source crowd, quote unquote. Yeah, we 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 all start, you know, we all we all have to start somewhere, and uh, and I and I've been there, and I understand, you know, where everyone comes from. So, uh, if you're open to contributing, if you want to contribute, small or large, I'll find something that that you can contribute with. Excellent. So, if you're interested in open source, definitely contact Amir. All right. All right. That's it for this episode. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and Bitcast. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook and visit CodePorn.com when you have nothing better to do. See you next time.